Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Sean McDowell. We're going to continue on with the uh, Christian philosophical apologetics as phenomenology. We're going to take a look at uh, pages 652 six, six, to 672. And we're going to look at uh, the chapter on challenging skepticism, which really is a, a response to David Hume. And we'll begin with uh, the influence of David Hume in block one. And uh, skepticism first evolved from uh, Pyro in around 275 B.C., and uh, certainty of knowledge was uh, posited as never being able to be truly claimed. Uh, in the medieval period, Augustine did oppose the skeptics, but even uh, in the 1600s, skepticism did resurface and gain popularity again. And then we have the... Uh, time of the Enlightenment, and we have the uh, publication of uh, the uh, Empiricus writings on skepticism, and uh, the notion was posited that knowledge is a leap of faith and not really rational. David Hume emerged within the uh, what would be contemporary philosophical environment, and he stated that the ideas were copies of impressions and that the pure scientific empiricism was the only method for knowledge. So Hume really does dominate our time as uh, really putting forth a very strict, pure scientific empiricism and uh, positing the notion that uh, Ideas are simply copies of impressions and not objective objective truths. Now under categories of skepticism, there is a global skepticism that the material and the immaterial reality are both unknowable with any certainty. There's local skepticism, which denies knowledge in certain areas or domains. There's knowledge skepticism. Knowledge requires absolute certainty, which is impossible to attain. There's justification skepticism. There's no attainable evidence for objective truth. And there is the uh, Pyronian skepticism that judgments concerning the true are impossible. And iterative skepticism that there's no way to evaluate the true. All of these can be abbreviated under David Hume, um, who is the uh, more or less the founder of the pure scientific empirical method, which really serves as a foundation for skepticism. So if you look at uh, note three, <clears throat> Hume did promote scientific empiricism. Belief is not perceivable by human reason. Belief is merely an instinct. There are relations of ideas, in other words, logic, and there are matters of fact. Logic is necessarily true. Matters of fact can be true or false. Most knowledge is not gained by deductive reasoning, and inductive reasoning is unreliable. It cannot, with certainty, predict future events. Cause and effect are ambiguous, subjective impressions only. And custom is the principle of conduct. So it's a, a huge opposing view to Christianity, and Hume does posit a very strict, pure, scientific, empirical method for knowledge. That's the starting point for this uh, lesson on skepticism. McDowell ne next takes a look at the answers to Hume in Block 2. Unger posited philosoph philosophical relativism, even uh, relative word meanings, and absolute certainty was posited as a, a requirement. 
and therefore, because that was a premise, then all knowledge becomes relative and doubtful. Descartes also equated knowledge with the requirement for certainty that became problematic. And Moore posited the two schools. You got the particularist, what do I know, and the Methodist, how do I know. Mosier uh, more recently emphasized description and perceiving over objective truth. Now Augustine, he's the first challenger of skepticism by declaring that it is self-refuting. Nobody is allowed to know that they are, nobody is allowed to not know that they are alive. The skeptic refutes the skeptical claim by stating that knowledge is not possible. So it's a, a self-refuting positive idea, says Augustine. Now we need to go to block three and take a look at uh, a big challenge for Christianity. Hume and the Christian concept of miracle. Now, uh, Hume defined miracle, and this is key. McDowell says that Hume defined miracle as a violation of the laws of nature. Violation, that's now it's a key term to understand here. Miracle is called a violation. And, uh, the Christian view posits eight aspects of miracle. It's a supernatural event. It is an immediate event. It is a rare event. It is an unpredictable event. It is unrepeatable through experiment. It is a moral event that promotes goodness and docks a glory. It's a demonstration of God's power. It does not contradict itself ever. And then, for believers, miracles have a purpose. They serve the message of God. They serve the messenger of God. So there's a very distinct and fully articulated challenge to Hume from Christianity. Believers truly differ from this pure scientific method and the concept of miracle. But let's take a look at our recall triad up at the top of column four kind of shape these first three moments together. And note one, empirical method, Hume's empiricism, limited the idea of knowledge to scientific method only. Two, extreme reactions resulted to Hume in either positing leftist relativism or rightist certainty, both of which were problematic. In the true two extremes posited leftist relativism or rightist certainty. Both of those are very problematic. Three, Christianity answers with a redefining of miracle by stating that it's a historical event of moral and eschatological quality. McDowell says that we need to redefine miracle as historical event, which is both moral in nature and eschatological in nature. By doing so, we don't have to uh, accept Hume's argument and definition of uh, violation because it is a historical event which serves an eschatological goal, a divine theistic eschatological goal. Now, if you look under uh, challenging that notion of violation in column four, miracles are not violations of nature. Cause and effect are not merely subjective assumptions. Describing a miracle as a violation presumes God's absence for, from creation. Science cannot exclude the fact that on occasion God acts in an unprecedented way. God is the volitional agent. God's actions change the boundary conditions of nature. They do not violate nature. Violation is to be refuted and negated, says McDowell. And I certainly agree with that. Miracles are not violations of nature, especially if nature is the general dispensation that has behind it a revealed dispensation. As believers, we certainly do not 
accept Hume's concept of violation, we negate it, we refute it. I agree emphatically here with McDowell on that point. So let's look at the recall triad again at the top of column four. The empirical method, Hume's empiricism, limited the idea of knowledge to scientific method only. Only. The reactions were extreme. They went anywhere from leftist relativism to rightist absolute certainty. Both of those are problematic and neither one of those are accepted by Christianity. Neither view. We don't posit absolute certainty. We posit uh, progressive unveiling and participatory unveiling of revelatory truth. We don't posit absolute certainty. We're on the path of sanctification and growing in wisdom of the divine and of the revelatory truth. We certainly don't posit either one of those extremes. In fact, we redefine miracle. Miracle is a historical event with the character of ethical morality and with the character, character of eschatological movement, a teleology, an eschatology. <clears throat> so this lesson gives us, I think, a very powerful response to skepticism. I agree completely with McDowell here. And uh, it is in alignment with his position of defending Christianity with um, a Christian phenomenology. A Christian phenomenology does not deny the empirical, but it asserts that the empirical includes philosophy of mind, philosophy of spirit, philosophy of subjective spirit. It does not reject the empirical method, but it says empiricism is phenomenology. It's empirical phenomenology. And from a pure empirical phenomenology, we can defend the Christian faith. I agree with, uh, and we've already covered that in the last two lessons. Uh, McDowell gave us a very powerful phenomenology. So this is consistent with that. This lesson is consistent with that Christian phenomenology. It's very consistent with that, and it includes a redefinition of miracle. I think that's key for this lesson. McDowell wants to redefine the concept of miracle. It is not to be refuted by leftist relativism. It is not to be refuted by rightist absolutism. It is instead an eschatological historical term. And I agree with McDowell 100% on that. So I think we have a very powerful lesson here that it's consistent with McDowell's Christian phenomenology. And we're going to pick up next time at, uh, this takes us, what, uh, from 652 to 672. We'll pick up next lesson with 673.